Okay, folks, we're going to move on to the uh, self-test questions that are in the um, tangential flow filtration notes. Um, so, the tangent, this is M. Um, and then the first question was really to ask you, I mean, I suppose just to get your, what do you notice about this type of membrane, or indeed most membranes when you look at them under the microscope, or just make it a little bit bigger. Um, and the first thing to say is that when you buy a membrane, the, the most, and this is a microfiltration membrane, it's it's a symmetric membrane, so it's the same all the way through. And you can see this one, a cellulose acetate one. And cellulose acetate is just a material that <coughs> um, acetates are made out of, or transparencies, which thankfully are disappearing out of the, the world of education in favour of, of digital tools. But um, I suppose I just wanted you to have a look at it and see what a real membrane looks like. and. Um, the two classic pore diameters that um, microfilters are characterized by are the 0.22 micron um, pore size and the 0.45 micron pore size. Um, they'd be standard um, membrane pore sizes used for, for kind of I suppose, sterilization type process where there's very few bacteria that will be smaller than that size. Um, most of them are up around the one micron level. But I suppose what, what I wanted you to get to look at really was how heterogeneous the, the pore structure is. Um, it's not, you know, every pore isn't the same size. So for example, if you look at this pore here, um, a bacterium that might not get through though this pore um, might, be might be lucky enough to meet this pore and, and get into the membrane. But whether it gets out of the membrane on the other side then really depends on a parameter called the, the tortuosity of, of the membrane, of the pores. And that's the degree to which the, the pore tunnel, if you like, twists and turns as you go through the membrane. Um, so really when you're talking about whether a particle gets through a membrane or not, there's a huge element of, I suppose, probability about it. You know, it's not a cut and dry process where, you know, if you've got a, a pore size of 0.22 um, and your your particle size is 0.1, there's no guarantee that your particle will get through the membrane. Um, likewise, a, a particle that is bigger than 0.22 might be lucky enough to travel through a little pore or a little tunnel that is actually a bit wider than the other ones. So, um, unless you're a long way from the pore size, either a lot smaller or a lot bigger, then there's this kind of um, vague area where particles may or may not get through, even though they're bigger or, or smaller than the, the rated pore size of, of the membrane. Um, and it's interesting to think about the whole COVID thing, um, you know, where people who are skeptical about the use of masks often say, I've heard the analogy that wearing a mask is like wearing a, um, a chain link fence to stop or, or using a chain link fence to stop a mosquito and um, when in fact it's nothing like that if you look at I have some um, uh, I don't want that I want this um, there if you look at the, a lot of the structures of, of fiber like materials under a microscope um, you can see that even though if you, you were to zoom into one of these, you know, um, there, like you could say, okay, you could technically say that the pore size there, whatever that means in the context of a fibrous mask, you might say that the the, the pore size is, is much greater than the size of a COVID particle, but um, there's loads of opportunity for a virus, even though it can get into the mask, to actually impinge on the structure of the mask. And there could be all sorts of electrostatic forces or, or whatever, or just a physical impinging and then maybe sticking to the surface of a fibre. So it's never as simple as people make out, particularly um, in social media and places. And I have to say, I always wear masks and sometimes I wear two of them, depending on you know where I am and, and how crowded it is, because it's a probabilistic thing. It's, you know, the, the probability of stopping a particle might be relatively small, um, but sometimes small reductions in viral load can be really important in terms of your how sick people get. So, you know, to say that a mask that has a rated pore size that is much bigger than the 
the virus is is like a chain link fence is, is totally un, untrue um, i like to think of the, the structure of a mask more like you know those um metal um pot scrubber things they're kind of aluminium i think they're made of aluminium but they're like a ball wire wall kind of thing they're three-dimensional they're not like a, a like a fence so it's, um, and that's why when you as i mentioned before in the context of ultrafiltration um ultrafiltrations although they're characterized on the basis of a molecular weight cut off it never means that if your protein has a, a higher molecular weight than the cutoff of the of the membrane then it's definitely going to be rejected it might be the same kind of probabilistic argument applies to it so you know i i would always use the precautionary principle when i'm out and about or in the supermarket or whatever um, it can't really do you any harm you know to wear a mask for an hour or two obviously if you're wearing a mask all day every day there could be issues i don't know what they are but certainly in terms of having the potential to reduce viral load that's always going to be there and um, regardless of of kind of you know rated pore sizes because you can see there if you look at that there's the concept of a pore size there doesn't really mean anything and um, so just back to the document and you can see there that there's a, a certain element of of heterogeneity about the pore size these ones up here you can see probably better there although that's but these ones these are made by actually um, subatomic particles um essentially burrowing their way through uh, well in a straight line through memory and these will be used for kind of research purposes um, rather than um, practical applications but that's something to bear in mind you know that, that whether a particle or indeed a molecule gets through a membrane really has because of the heterogeneity of the the, mem the membrane structure um, has an element of probability about it you know and if you're unless you're being reckless really you should wear a mask because there's there is a high chance that it will reduce your the viral load on you Okay, so I'll just try and do all of these in one video this time, and then I'll, there's another set of them at the end of, or separate to the, to the actual notes. So where's the next one? Okay, so. Okay, so this had to do with the fact that, okay, we saw in the continuous system, the flux declines with time. Okay, so we just get the sort of gradual, uh, fast drop at the start and then, then it levels off um, and that's where you're operating at a constant concentration so what would happen in a batch system and i'll, I'll just um i'll go into my little pad here and show you okay so i'll get my pad here okay so I'm going to just draw a few strands together and um, so we saw essentially that if you let me just make sure of a decent size pen here so if you draw remember we're talking about tangential flow filtration so there is at the, when you turn on your pump you do get an observable decline in flux whereas if it's in ultrafiltration your flux just kind of establishes instantaneously um, so if you're if you've got a say a particular member looking at experiments where c is equal to a constant and imagine we start off with some con our concentration c is well actually i won't complicate things there so so this is c equal to constant okay i'll actually can use colors to demonstrate this so basically in tangential flow filtration you get something like this and in an ideal scenario where the membrane itself doesn't deteriorate gets roughly a steady state flux um, now one of the things you might have noticed I think when we were um, talking about the effect of pressure and I showed you I have a diagram in the notes I think for yeast cells that if you say do an experiment where you measure uh, the steady state flux I'll just put a J steady state on that as a function of your transmembrane pressure I just call that delta P if we call it delta PTM whichever it doesn't matter but we got this kind of effect okay remember this is not as dramatic as you get an ultrafiltration an ultrafiltration that goes dead flat no matter what you're ultrafiltering 
So imagine this is, uh, I'll just call this a, uh, a high pressure or a high concentration. And then call this a low concentration. So remember, this is tangential flow filtration. And we see that if you've got, a, the lower the concentration, the higher the flux. Okay? And that's that's universally observed. You don't get the nice log dependence that you get in ultrafiltration, though you tend to get, it's, it's just all over the place. It really depends on what you're filtering, but you, the, you don't really see that nice log thing that you get in ultrafiltration. Okay, so what this kind of experiment does is it establishes that the concentration or the flux is higher if you have a low concentration. So we could roughly say that J steady state is proportional to concentration power of minus N, where a lot of data is around, you know, ends around 0.4 or so, that kind of region. So Basically, you get higher fluxes at lower concentrations, or conversely, lower fluxes at um, lower fluxes at higher concentrations. So let's look at a batch um, scenario. And batch actually, batch tangential flows filtration. The filtration is quite interesting. I did it many years ago with one of my PhD students. Um, and remember, in a batch system, I just remind you of what a batch system looks over here. You've got your tank. And you go into your membrane, you're producing your filtrate, then your retentate goes back. Um, and if you're to look at how the concentration changes with time in a batch tangential flow system, it goes like that. So because you're losing liquid, but you're not losing any solid. So obviously, if you're losing liquid and retaining the solid, then your concentration goes up. So if we look over here again, that means that as the concentration goes up, um, that increase in concentration has the tendency to reduce the flux in comparison to what it would be if the concentration was constant. So if you have a batch system, you know, you're going to get something a lot lower. So this would be see see um increasing so you're going to get lower at a, at a similar time you're going to get lower constant or lower fluxes because in a continuous system your concentration's the same the whole time so all you're seeing really is the build up of the cake due to just time essentially and but and when you've got a batch system, you've got the additional effect of your concentration increasing. I mean, mathematically, you can you can kind of justify, but actually, I don't really want to go into maths at the moment. But but I hope hopefully that's kind of logical that you have two things going on. You've in a continuous system, you've got time is changing, but in a batch system, you've got time and concentration changing. So that's con continuous and that's uh, batch. The, the net effect then mean that you're going to have, after a particular time, you'll have a lower flux in a batch system. Um, so that's all there was to that particular one. Um, what else did I ask you about? I think I asked you something about back flushing, if I remember correctly. Sketch a plot of flux versus time for a system undergoing periodic black back flushing. I asked you to draw three cycles I'll maybe just draw one because my drawing is so bad but so let's do that I'll go into my, my tablet thing and I'll just get rid of all this stuff okay so I'll draw my axis here draw it in a nice fetching green I'll give myself a decent space here on the time axis. So if time here and a flux here. And uh, let me just draw my flux. So the idea in, in back flushing is we want to really increase our overall absorption. That's a that's a flux there, Jay. 
Uh, we want to increase our average flux over a long period. So I'll just draw one of these um, cycles. If, like, so what we see in a, in a tangential flow, so again, this is tangential flow filtration. It's not, I used to always call this cross flow filtration, but I think TFF, tangential flow, is used more in industry. Um, get that impression anyway. Okay. So now the flux is declining. And we can see it's 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 heading down the whole time. And at this point, we decide, okay, enough is enough. The flux is getting too low. Let's back flush. So what we do is, obviously, does, your rig has to be a bit more sophisticated. So you need uh, controllers and, and solenoid valves and all that kind of stuff, which obviously adds to cost. But what we do here now is we back flush. So if you like, instantaneously, the fluid's going the other way. Um, so you immediately go to a negative flux. So we'll just stick an axis there to show you that this is actually negative flux. So if the fluid is going the other way, that means this is a negative flux. So here we start off, we've back flushed. And while the, the, the fluid is back flushing, it's clearing out. The, the idea of back flushing is that not only does it blast material off the surface of the membrane, but if we think think of, of the pore of a membrane, I'll just draw kind of a sketch of a membrane here. This is why back flushing is so useful. Um, you know, you might have uh, particles up here that have deposited on the membrane. And it, then some smaller particles might have penetrated into the membrane. So this, if you like, is the cake building up. And generally, certainly my habit over the years has been to refer to what happens when inside the pore as um, fouling of the membrane. But some people are quite loose about the term fouling. I, I like to reserve it for something that's happening to the membrane itself, whereas cake formation um, is on the surface of the membrane. Um, so the flu is flowing through here. And it turns out that if you back flush periodically and you you um, at a certain pressure. So by blasting the fluid back there, you're obviously going to blow this stuff off. That's the idea, which will also clean the internal pores, hopefully, of the membrane. That seems to be the case um, that, that this happens. And so if we look at our little cycle of um, what's happening, because you're cleaning the pore here, um, and also you're wiping the cake, your flux will actually improve, but it's a negative flux, so it'll go like that. You get a slight increase, a negative increase, so you're getting it because as the pores clean. And then I'm gonna, I wish I had a ruler now. Um, I'll try and do this. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to put my finger up. Okay, I'll do this. I can do this. So then we reverse back to where we were. Now the thing is, and this is crucial, how far back do you get? You'll rarely get back to where you were to a nice clean membrane. So your, your membrane is clean there. Um, and probably what will happen is you'll get back to somewhere a little bit less. And you go through that cycle again. So you're going through this kind of cycle. So by doing that back flush, you've gained this amount of flux. Um, and then the next time you might do it, maybe this will be a tiny bit lower, you know, so gradually, and that this could be, you know, this might happen very slowly. So your deterioration might happen over weeks or months. Um, but you rarely get back to the, the absolute clean value of the start there. Um, but you get close to it with, with back flushing. Or, Another version of back flushing is called back pulsing, where this happens really quickly. You know, back flushing, this could be over a period of, you know, tens of seconds, whereas with, with back pulsing, it can be much faster, the order of a second or whatever. But obviously, there's some sort of optimization that you need to do, because every time you're back flushing, you're not producing your, your filtrate. You know, there's no filtrate coming out. So that means a loss in productivity. So 
if you spend all your time back flushing, you're producing nothing. So, and if you spend so much time, or if your back flushing only happens very rarely, then this flux is going to drop so much between each between each back flush that your 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 going your net production of filtrates going to be be reduced. So there's some nice papers written on the optimization of this. In other words, how often do I back flush and what should the duration of my back flush be? So, um, but they're all a bit dodgy because as I said, the underlying theory for fluxes just isn't good enough really when you're dealing with particles. So off we go again. Oh, just make that black for our second cycle. And the whole thing just starts repeating itself. So you just go down again. And and on and on, so you go back, you get to here, and you start heading down again. Um, so it's it's um, that's what's happening in backflush. I think in the the next little bunch of problems on TFF, I think I want to, you to look at cross flushing, which I, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, so that's what backflushing would look like, and membrane fouling. I, think I, yeah, it was just those three. So what I'll do is I'll stop there with these and I'll do the rest of them that, that were additional to the notes. I'll do those now. So that's that.